Good afternoon, everyone. It's like church, right? Most of the people are sitting in the back. If you feel inclined, this is by far going to be the most exhilarating, exciting panel of the conference. So you want to get close so that you can absorb uh, everything that's going to be said this afternoon. Uh, my name is Captain Mark Adamczyk. I'm a member of the faculty here at the United States Naval Academy, and I'd like to welcome you. You've been welcomed many, many times before. But let me also add my welcome to the United States Naval Academy, a national treasure. We appreciate the time uh, you all have uh, committed to come here and uh, learn and share from and with each other. I had a real nice conversation with the faculty over lunch, and um, I can tell you right now that the students here, you are really great hands. Uh, some of the brightest and uh, most innovative thinkers on the subject of leadership uh, are, are amongst you and within your midst, so capitalize on that opportunity. I'm in charge for the next hour and a half, so uh, I've got a couple of game rules right up front. The first thing is I thought I'd shake things up a little bit, and uh, instead of having a panel discussion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly pick on a student to come up here and sing their college's alma mater. <laughs> okay, do I have any volunteers? It's just what I expected. Oh, I see one volunteer in the back. You see, this was your opportunity to really shine, and that's what a true leader is, is capitalizing on opportunity. No, we're not going to do that at all. We have such a distinguished panel. I'm truly honored to be here to moderate this. We're talking about best practices. We have four gentlemen up here who are distinguished in their own regard in terms of cultivating and fostering excellence within their organizations, and that w is what we're going to focus on. To my far left is uh, head Navy men's soccer coach. His name is uh, Mr. Dave Brandt. You can read his bio. I'm not going to spend time on bios. They're in your program. Please don't read them while they're speaking, uh, but I don't want to embellish uh, their contributions. They stand on their own merit. To my left is Commander Keith Hoskins. He's the third battalion officer. Uh, Keith, uh, again, a distinguished naval aviator. I do know that Keith's dream when he grows up is to become me, and um, that's not happening, but I told him I'd make fun of him. To my right is truly an American hero, uh, Admiral Shoemaker. Uh, his bio is just so impressive. And to my far right is Mr. Tim Sullivan, a very accomplished and successful businessman, and he doesn't know this, but when I grow up, I want to be him. So uh, with that, the format will be, uh, I'll give each of our panelists five to 10 minutes or so to just offer their unique, their personal perspective on how they've gone about cultivating this cycle of excellence, this, uh, this progression and transformation in organizations uh, that's unique in their own profession. So we'll start first with uh, Coach Brandt. Thanks, and I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I'm happy just to get out of my little cage. I left my, uh, left my office, which I don't do often enough, and, uh, you know, we all kind of operate in our realms, or maybe, uh, you know, when you guys get out and are doing uh, some different things, and so for me, it's athletics, 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 and that's okay, but I'm happy to be just be out of the box in the cage of athletics, be able to talk about leadership uh, a little bit. So for me, since that is my background, obviously it's within the realm um, and the context of athletics. But, um, uh, you know, I'll say a couple things, throw a few things at you guys, and then we'll move on. Um, you know, I, I won't say much, of course, about my background, and, and it's in the bio and all that, but it's maybe important to note that I was at uh, a Division III program, athletics program called Messiah College in Pennsylvania for a long number of years came to the Naval Academy two years ago. So, you know, w within things I'm saying, uh, what, what was done at Messiah in terms of, of this cycle of success is in process now for me at the Naval Academy. It's a bit of a role switch for me. But in, in talking about leadership, maybe the first thing that I would say to you guys is I, I believe in what I would call a compelling sense of purpose as a basis for leadership philosophy, okay? A compelling sense of purpose. This compelling sense of purpose for me then essentially becomes the leader's vision for his or her, her organization. In saying that, I also believe, in, in my experience, that leaders often make what I would call a fundamental mistake in identifying what that vision is or what that sense of purpose is. It's very, very common in business that we refer to or think of just making a profit 
as that vision. You know, what are you here to do? I'm here to make a profit. In athletics, of course, every coach knows one thing. I mean, there's no coach that doesn't know this one thing, and that's that he or she wants to win. And so I believe a fundamental mistake we make relative to leadership is we identify that as our compelling sense of purpose. And for me, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with making a profit and winning. In fact, you know, those things are very, very important. In fact, they're our lifeblood. I mean, we, we can't go without them. We, we've got to have them. But, you know, for me, I've identified maybe three quick things that spell out a problem with that. You know, one, neither define who you are. Two, neither separate you from anyone, uh, from anyone else. I mean, those two things are very common. Everybody has those in common. Everybody wants those things in those particular fields. And I think the third thing is, to me at least, there is nothing that I would at least define or call compelling about either. You know, nothing that in and of itself will, will capture and move the human heart closer to, to what we could call its capacity for greatness. Um, you know, these two, two programs that I've been involved with, um, to give you an idea, you know, a compelling sense of purpose, I'm talking about that. Where I was at Messiah, we talked about being the best place in the country to play college soccer. Now, I want to define that quickly for you. We didn't say the best team. Uh, it was a Division three school, and while it was a very, very good team, you know, probably not realistic for us to say, well, we're going to be better than every ACC, Big East, Big Ten school, that sort of thing. We kept it to something that we could control, and we said, this is going to be the best place in the country to play soccer. At Navy, I've tilted that just a little bit, and we talk all the time about our sense of purpose being an extraordinary team. So it was things like having the right people, the best guys, the best coaches, the most compelling vision, the best style, the best team chemistry, relationships, sense of personal growth. I mean, all of these things that are a little bit different from, from winning, of course. And so everything in our philosophy, in my leadership philosophy, is geared around those things. Those things are our identity, as opposed to winning, which, yeah, it's our lifeblood. I mean, it, it's the point. We're going after it. We're taking dead aim. But there's a critical difference there. Uh, when the vision is taught and modeled well, I believe it creates what I would call a culture. Uh, once you've created a culture, if that culture is strong enough and well enough defined, what begins to happen is you begin to attract what I would call like-minded people. People who want to be a part of something that's identifiable, well-defined, come in and they become the right people for your organization. And they take a pride in who you are. Not the fact that, you know, what your record is or the number of championships you've won or whatever. It's a much deeper and stronger thing than that. Um, I, I coined a phrase over the last number of years, and I, I'm not even fully sure how to explain uh, how I got it, but there's a phrase I use, and it's called catching the butterfly. And I'm going to explain what that means. Um, you know, I, I believe that leaders, coaches in my field, I don't know many coaches who are opposed to good things like great team chemistry, you know, the starters treating the reserves well, the upperclassmen treating the underclassmen well, wh whatever you're going to say. Personal growth, good things happening in people's lives, uh, people having a good experience through athletics. I don't know anybody opposed to that. Everybody agrees those are good things. But in athletics at least, especially the higher level you go, they appear to be elusive. You know, coaches want them, they're for them, but far be it from them to say, well, we know how to grab this. So where the euphemism, catching the butterfly, comes from, I, somewhere along the line, after talking to enough coaches about this and, you know, playing against them and observing, I somehow came to picture uh, coaches sitting in a chair, like, like I am now, and there's a butterfly who's kind of flying, you know, dancing within reach, right in front of their eyes. And, and these coaches, they stare at the butterfly. They're transfixed by it. Why? Well, the butterfly represents what they want. The butterfly represents, in athletics at least, you know, that year. You know that year. You guys, enough of you have, have, have uh, participated in athletics. That year where, you know, you got great team chemistry, everybody gets along, you've got the whole greater than the sum of the parts thing, the bounces go your way, and, you know, that year in athletics. So they stare at it, and it becomes something that, you know, that, that, that they want. So if there was something like that flying around in front of you, what would you do? Well, you know, you try to grab it. So I came to picture coaches who are looking at this thing, and at some point, you know, boom, 
they reach and try to get it. But you know how butterflies fly. They kind of drop up and down, left, or it's an inconsistent pattern. And so it's a little tricky to catch, right? And so, you know, they've grabbed, they open their hand, ah, missed it, missed it again, you know, whatever. Things not impossible to catch, and my experience in athletics for a lot of years was, you know what? Once out of every four or five tries, boom, ah, look at that, what do you know? We got it. For me, that was too random. And so in, in, in creating what I sought to create uh, at Messiah and what I'm seeking to create here, what, what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to uh, have principles that create a culture that effectively give us what I would call a big butterfly net, you know, where we're not trying to grab this thing with one hand. We've got a mechanism by which to, quote, unquote, catch the butterfly every year. Um, let me say one other thing. Um, you know, I talk to my guys all the time, my players, uh, about what I think is an important distinction, and maybe this is e easy and obvious, between a leader and someone who is in charge. Um, the authority to tell someone what to do, that designates who's in charge. The ability to, to capture the hearts of people, that tells you who the leader is, and I think there's an important and fundamental difference there. Um, Got a quote for you that I love, and I'll end on this, um, but, but with regard to this whole idea of uh, vision, compelling sense of purpose, uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, U2 frontman Bono said, he said this, and I'm not even sure what he's referring to it, but I, I, I apply it to what we're talking about. He says, if you judge success by the fact that we can afford to build this house, now, I've not seen Bono's house, but go figure, right? He says, it's a dangerous measure. He said, I judge success by how close I am to the melody I hear in my head. And that's the key part that I really latch on to, this idea of a melody you hear in your head. I don't think that has anything to do with, with championships, winning, making big profits. It, that's where I get this compelling sense of purpose idea. And I think for leaders, there needs to be some sort of vision, some sort of melody that you hear in your head. Thank you very much, Coach. I appreciate that. Okay, before I let Commander Huskins uh, give his introductory remarks, what I'd like for you, particularly the students, to start thinking about is hearing the philosophy, hearing this voice, and asking questions, formulating questions in your own mind where the panelists can offer you tangible, sort of concrete explanations about how they might apply their view of this cycle of success uh, as it relates to their own experience. This afternoon is supposed to be much more about the application, and Coach can talk in more specific details about how we actually did these things. These are the types of questions I'd like to see you start formulating in your mind so that when we're done with all four panelists, we'll have a line going out the back door of people who just can't wait to ask a question to one of these exceptional gentlemen. So, uh, Commander Hoskins. Thank you very much, Captain Adamczyk. Uh, everybody, welcome to the uh, Leadership Conference. It's good to be here, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, you know, uh, as you can see in my personal bio, uh, I'm an aviator by trade. And, uh, you know, in my profession, uh, I would like to say that in my profession, uh, it deals with a lot of uh, precision, accuracy, a lot of hard work uh, because of the type of environment in which we operate as a uh, tactical aviator. And for those of you that are not real familiar with tactical aviation, uh, specifically my platform that I fly is the FA-18 Hornet, which is the, uh, the premier fighter attack aircraft uh, that is in the United States Navy and the Marine Corps inventory. So uh, I've had 21 years of service and I've had the opportunity to lead at many different levels uh, from a very junior officer all the way up to a commanding officer of a um, seagoing fleet FA-18 squadron. And I think that over the years, I've been pretty consistent with the way that I view leadership. And it is kind of a cookie cutter, if you want to call it that type of leadership style that I have, because I've always been a person of simplicity. I try to keep it uh, simple, uh, short sound bites, and uh, because that, that's the type of environment that we work in, in a tactical environment uh, in aviation. Uh, the first thing that uh, comes to mind when I think of the cycle of success or the cycle of leadership is something that I learned from uh, a senior officer when I was a junior officer, and that is 
uh, never pass up or give up the opportunity to lead. It's just that simple. Uh, as a very, very junior officer, I, I sat in front of the commanding officer and the senior uh, officer as they briefed a flight. And it was brief that if the commanding officer had a aircraft issue, that I would be the leader of that flight. And uh, I was very new to the squadron. I was intimidated. And uh, uh, more or less, I, I did not want to take the lead. I learned something in a matter of five minutes when that senior officer pulled me aside and said, you will never turn down the opportunity to lead. And I, I, to this day, uh, I embrace that. And I try to use that every day in which I uh, rise out of bed and come to work. So that's number one, never turn down the opportunity to lead. Number two and three are pretty simple. I'm a, a big believer in self-evaluation, honest self-evaluation as a leader. Uh, we have so many opportunities throughout the day when we interact with our staff, our peers, subordinates. Um, you know, we know what the mission is for that particular day. We may even know what the long-term mission is, but how are you plugged in as an individual uh, when it comes to implementing all of the ideals and all the principles and, 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 and all of the, um, the goals that pertain to that ultimate mission, whatever it may be, if it's in the military or the civilian sector? How are you plugged in and how are you performing? Uh, sometimes, I will be honest with you, that is a little eye-opening when you're really honest with yourself and when you fall a little bit short and how you're going to pick yourself up uh, to do better the next time. Never be satisfied and never settle. And number three is also tied with number two, and uh, you know that's that's evaluating the institution uh, as a whole. How is the institution doing based on your performance? Um, you know, who do you communicate with? Who who, who are your peers, and and, and at what level uh, can you communicate your concerns on how to make the institution better? Because in the long run, it's going to make you better, makes the institution better, and therefore it enhances mission success mission readiness and whatever the goals may be for your particular um, company or institution that you work for so that's kind of my big three you know, you know like I said I'm I'm a pretty simple guy and I always go by by threes of everything and I'm and I know that my comments are going to spark uh, a lot of questions and I will be ready to embrace those um, I just want to tell kind of a short story uh, when I talked to Captain Adamczyk about what I was going to say uh, I, I want to give you kind of some tangibles on uh, a situation that I was faced with when I became the commanding officer of my F-A-18 squadron. Now, I just want to set the stage because, again, there's some folks in here that may not be familiar um, with the environment in which we work. But uh, picture this, a squadron, 250 sailors and officers, 10 airplanes, uh, a very large budget, um, we are essentially one year away from deploying, getting ready to go into operations into um, Afghanistan. Um, when I took over, the squadron was failing. The commanding officer was relieved early, and I took over command early. So I walked into um, a very, very um, unsatisfactory condition as a commanding officer. So. Uh, Immediately, I had to do a critical analysis of that particular command because I had to go from being the worst in the entire air wing. Air wing is, I'm, I'm one of seven squadrons within an air wing that goes on a ship. Uh, at this particular time, it was a USS Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and I had a lot of leadership breathing down my neck. We had failed uh, multiple maintenance inspections. Um, we had failed... Uh, other inspections, safety evaluations. I mean, this is hard times. I mean, we got one year to fix it. So when I did the time critical uh, analysis of the institution and the people that work there, uh, I will be honest, I had to make some changes uh, because they had to be enduring changes and I had to insert some enduring principles that were long lasting within this command. And it was kind of a top-down approach. I had to take a look at the officers that I had uh, that worked for me at that particular time, uh, our senior enlisted members, our chief petty officers that are more of the managers uh, that we use in the fleet, and then, of course, the sailors. And what I had to do, what I, what I found out, was I really had to sell ownership, buy-in, of what we're trying to do as a command and where we were going. 
And when I started talking about days, 365 days before we go into Afghanistan, combat operations, when I had to talk to our maintenance um, department about the 10 airplane that we own and how we were going to get those 10 airplanes ready and how we were going to do it safely, by the book, as per all you know, Navy maintenance instructions, not taking any shortcuts, just doing everything right, and how, and how you imbue that type of thought process and that ownership. I tell you what, it was very challenging, and it didn't happen overnight, uh, but it took some time. I got everybody to buy in, and uh, I'd say in about two to three months, I saw a big turnaround, huge turnaround. And by the end of my command tour, I'm happy to say that I left my legacy there. And that squadron now that I have left, don't laugh, not because I left, but uh, that squadron now is one of the top squadrons in the air wing because that legacy just continued because of what you imbued uh, amongst those people that were there in that command. It's that legacy that keeps going. And I think that's very, very important uh, as a leader. And if I would, just to wrap up um, my little speech here, uh, some of the, the keys to success on, on, on how you do that. And I think this, again, this applies across uh, the board. Uh, mission statements. In the military, we do a lot of mission statements. Corporate America, mission statements. You go to every website, there's a mission statement. Make it relevant. Make it relevant that people can understand and people can grasp and people can recite it. It has to be relevant. Uh, number two, provide an environment in which people can, can work, can live, and grow. If you have people that are happy, people that can't wait to get to work, and I call it the people that when they leave work, they roll down the window and turn up the radio and they're singing all the way home because they had such a great day at work. That's what we do as leaders, provide that environment so that people can grow. Third thing, be consistent. Be consistent as a leader in everything that you do. You know, when you talk about... Uh, you know, the big picture message, whatever that, that mission statement says, wherever your goal is at the end of a month, a quarter, a year, be consistent, okay, and uh, obtaining all of those short-term goals and long-term goals. And also be consistent, um, you know, with your uh, constant communication with the people that work for you so that you never go off the path and you always stay on the right path to success. And then the last one is, uh, which I think is very, very important. We talked about, or I talked about the ownership piece, but empowering your people. Empowering your people to know that they have all the capabilities, they have the education, they have the resources, they have the leadership in place, the management in place, so that they are empowered to do the right thing always. When people aren't looking, and definitely when people are looking. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Hoskins. I appreciate that. Admiral, you're up, sir. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in the panel here. And uh, let me commend the audience, particularly the young people in the audience, uh, for their interest in leadership. Because uh, you're at your very formative years, and there's nothing, you're working on your bachelor's degrees in various fields. Uh, but when you look back, as I do over my uh, career, um, there's nothing more important than, than leadership. Surely you have to be technologically capable in your field, but, but leadership is the thing that's going to uh, allow you to achieve success and, uh, and happiness as well. Um, I probably have some classmates in the audience here, um, and, and we may be long in tooth, but we're, we're fairly short, I mean, but uh, we're not short in experience. You have more hair than me, sir. Uh, okay. <laughs> But uh, the, uh, I, I want to, you know, as you walk around this yard, you see a lot of statues and things. And uh, they, they commemorate people that we admire and we, we like to use as uh, role models. And there are several uh, statues that are just 100 yards away here. They happen to be nine feet tall. Uh, one is of uh, Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was in prison with me for uh, many years. And also uh, Admiral Jim, uh, Admiral uh, uh, Bill Lawrence, who was the superintendent here, and uh, so I, I've been very fortunate in my career to to be uh, exposed to mostly good leaders. But there have been a few bad ones along the way, 
And so I've kind of categorized, in my mind, you know, what makes a good leader and, and, and a bad leader. Um, I, I think a lot of the people in the audience here, and surely my classmates, will remember that in our plebe year we had to memorize a lot of things. And there's a quotation by, you've heard of John Paul Jones, whose crypt is up here. I hope you'll see, you visitors will visit before you leave. Uh, but anyway, the police have to memorize, and here, 55 years after the fact, I still remember that it is by no means enough that a gentleman, that a uh, officer of the Navy be a capable mariner. He must be that, of course, but also a great deal more. He should be as well a gentleman of refined manners, punctilious courtesy, and the nicest sense of personal honor. Well, old John Paul had, I think, uh, nailed it right on the head as, as to what it takes to be a leader. Surely you have to become an expert in some field, aviation or surface warfare, warfare and business, as Mr. Sullivan will uh, attest to in a moment. Um, but you simply have to maintain a high ethical standard if you expect anybody uh, to follow you. Um, there's a, a classmate of mine that recently acquainted me with, uh, with some history that I should have been aware of about uh, the conquest of the Northwest Territories in the United States. And uh, it, it's about two guys that were Army captains, uh, Lewis and Clark. And uh, if you ever want to study a, a real neat picture in, in leadership, you ought to read a book by uh, Stephen Ambrose called uh, Undaunted Courage. Because these two guys, uh, along with about 35 uh, enlisted men and one dog, and one uh, young girl, 16 years old, Indian, named uh, Saka Gouya, uh, made it all the way to uh, the West Coast and back. It, it was a two-year struggle in which they had to fight off the Indians, uh, hunger, uh, lack of communication. They, they were actually on a mission from President uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, it, but they were without communication with him. Uh, and, and it's just a marvelous story. They made it there and back. Uh, they lost one guy who would have died anyway from an appendicitis, but they, they took care of each other. And uh, it's a neat, uh, neat thing to, to do. So what makes a good leader? Uh, well, uh, I, I would say, first of all, you, you have to want to be a leader. Um, you, you have to aspire to, uh, to that position. And uh, there, there is no magic formula in my mind. There are some elements that, that go together as I look over these past uh, associates that I've had, and I've kind of listed them here. Like, certainly you have to, well, I'll just list them, five of them is, you need a goal, you need to be uh, able to communicate that goal, you need to be an optimist, you need to be a psychologist, and you have to have high ethical standards. So let me dwell a little bit on those five points. Um, a goal, and you know, if you don't know where you're going, you sure as heck can't expect your subordinates to, uh, to go along with you. Uh, and, and not only do you need a goal, but you need a lofty goal. You may need a butterfly uh, uh, to, to capture. Because people are looking, are always looking for idea people. Um, you know, the, the masses are, are kind of used to just kind of drifting along, but you need a, a person to inspire them and, and to define a, a goal. Now, the best goal or idea you might have in your mind is absolutely worthless unless you're able to communicate that in some fashion to people you're trying to lead. And communication takes a lot of uh, avenues as well, uh, 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 speaking and writing and, and, and just uh, acting as a, a role model is a form of communication as well. Um, uh, in my background was I was in prison for uh, eight years and uh, you know, we talk about a term, uh, a fair weather sailor, you know, it's kind of easy to lead when, when the winds are, are blowing right and, and the seas aren't too rough, but you know, when they get rough and when there's stress, as there was in prison, um, that's where uh, true leadership rises to the forefront. And, and we had great leaders uh, in prison, uh, but they needed to communicate. We needed to sing off the same song sheet. And so we developed a, a system that a lot of you may have heard about, but others may not have, by simply tapping uh, uh, through concrete walls. Most of us were in solitary confinement, as I was for three years, 
and you would just ring up a guy on the other side of the wall with a and uh, to uh, most of the older people in the audience, that's shaving a haircut, and they come back with two bits, and you know it's an American on the other side, and so you, you tap away, and it's amazing how much information you can convey in, in uh, uh, through the wall and, and with some brevity. So communication is really important if, if you aspire to become a good leader. Now my third point is about optimism. Now who in the heck is going to follow a, a pessimist? You know, I mean, there's no uh, inspiration in following a pessimist. So you fake it if you have to, but for Christ's sakes, be an optimist, and uh, uh, and you'll get people to share your your enthusiasm and uh, spirit for that too. Uh, my fourth point is about becoming a, a psychologist. Now, when I was uh, midshipman here, we studied uh, engineering primarily. Now, I'm pleased to see that it's kind of broadened into into other fields as well. But uh, th then when I went to flight training, uh, I, I was probably the best aviator in the Navy. You know, th th you ask any aviator, they're always the best Navy uh, aviator in the world. But, but I was a technician, you know, I knew how to get airplanes aboard aircraft carriers and things like that. But um, there, there's more to leadership than, than just that. Uh, you'll be charged with uh, and, and responsible for uh, accomplishing the mission with the resources you're given, and, and the resources are mostly people. And uh, sometimes it takes uh, a young person a while to realize that people are important. And, and people have uh, needs and wants and aspirations and, and desires and hurts and fears. And you've, you've got to identify with the people that you're trying to lead, that you're sympathetic to uh, uh, to their motivations or their problems in life. And, you know, if, uh, if you're an investment guy like Mr. Sullivan here, uh, you're going to find that the cheapest investment you can ever make, make is uh, uh, with some sailor who's having a problem and, and you can offer some words of uh, solace or understanding or, 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 or help. And then, um, by the way, uh, I've watched uh, or listened to Governor Ridge uh, yesterday afternoon, I guess it was, and I thought he, he had some good uh, nuggets in there. He talked about, uh, let me preface this by saying that you know, we, we military people particularly always aspire to higher rank, and, and that's the way it should be. Uh, and, and, and with rank, we, can, uh, we, we have the, the force of law behind us. We can tell some guy, we want you to do this or we want you to do that. And, and that's what Governor Ridge called compliance. You know, you can ensure compliance by virtue of the fact that you, you wear a lot of gold on your sleeves or, or you're in a certain position in, in your company. But what you really are, should be seeking is, is commitment, commitment from these young people that are your associates and subordinates. Um, so they're, they're committed to your goals and, and, uh, and, and to uh, furthering the, the mission of the organization. And then finally, uh, you're not going to get very far in life unless you maintain your, your own uh, sense of, of uh, uh, integrity and ethical standards. Uh, you know, in the newspapers you read every once in a while, uh, some guy that's really achieved what you think is really high success and, and uh, he's got an Achilles heel. He's, he, he, uh, uh, has committed fraud of some sort or, or less than ethical behavior. So the fastest way to go downhill is to uh, step over that line and not be ethical. So I hope you've generated a bunch of questions or you will ask the panel because really the benefit of this hour and a half you're going to be spending up here is in, in our interface and not in our uh, conversation here. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Sullivan. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a panel with this esteemed group of leaders. I'm, I'm actually pretty humbled by it. In my office, when they heard I'd be sitting up here, I, I have to be honest with you, there were a few eyebrows raised about what's an investment guy doing up here with this group to my left. Um, but I also am honored to uh, come back here to the place that, for me, was really a formative uh, learning environment when it, it came to leadership. As you probably know from my bio, uh, I was in the leadership 
business, if you will, uh, way back when I was here at the academy in the learning mode and then learning on the job, as we all do once we entered the fleet for a uh, seven-year time before I went, uh, left the Navy, went back to graduate school, and then uh, entered the business that I'm in now. And that business, I would tell you today, is uh, what I would call um, the leadership assessment business. We learned all these great techniques, uh, financial techniques and skills at graduate school, at business school, which is where I went, um, on cash flows, financial statements and the like. But the uh, skills that I fall back on today, being in the business over 20 years now, uh, in making assessments and then partnering with these management teams are basically the leadership lessons that I've learned during the time I was here, the time that I was in the fleet. And as you've been hearing over these last two days, there's a lot of learning through observing going on, and that's continued even in the role that I'm in now as an investment professional. Um, what do I look for in, in these partnership situations? Because my firm takes endowment money from places like the Naval Academy, and invest with management teams in businesses with the hope that we can create shareholder value, grow the business, take it public, or sell the business for more than it's worth. And the key thing that I do from the first time I meet the management team is I basically try and assess the leadership team. And what do I look for? At the start, it's leadership, in my mind, comes from the top. So I'm looking for a leader that Colonel Athens, who I think is here in the audience, he, he actually summarized it great a few years ago at a conference like this, where he described great leadership as having uh, a competency in their profession, a uh, courage to make the tough decisions, and then compassion for their people. And I would say when I was listening to him, those were exactly the attributes that I look at and look for coming from the top. I then look at the team. And what I'm looking for there is, is the empowerment and the debate and the individual knowledge, meaning that you've got a leader on top that's comfortable enough in their own skin that they know what they know and they know what they don't know, and they're surrounding themselves with people in those skills that they're not as good at. So they're okay letting the people underneath them know, I don't know that, but you do. So help me bring the business along and they fill themselves, they complement the skills that they have. And the last thing I try and assess is what's the culture of the business. And that's probably the toughest thing, and it's the thing that, if I'm wrong on, is the hardest to remedy. If you have a bad leader at the top, if I've made a bad decision there, you can seek to find somebody to replace them. But a culture in an organization is deeply rooted. And what I'm talking about there is this shared vision, which you've heard on here today, values and integrity. If you have an organization that is steeped in that, and the Navy, in my experience, is steeped in those things, going back to John Paul Jones, in businesses it's not always that way. And if you have problems with a business that doesn't have integrity and honor, I think you're going to have a problem with your investment and it's going to be very difficult to turn that around. So we try and spend a lot of time on what's a very gray area, finding out how decisions are made, finding about, out about crisis situations. How did the leadership react to it? Did they do the right thing? Did they do the high integrity thing? Did they take shortcuts or not? And in that diligence phase, as we call it, we're trying to make those judgments along with what are the financials, what's the growth prospects of the business, and the like. We're going to talk about best practices for the cycle of success because I can make a great assessment at the front end of a business on those metrics I just discussed. But the fact is we're in an investment for over, can be over 10 years. And managers retire, people get ill, all kinds of things can happen. So you have to have embedded in the business a cycle of success, a succession planning development program within the organization so that if calamity hits or people have a life change or whatever it may be, you have others within the organization who can step up to the plate. And I look for certain things in our, again, in our diligence phase and in what we try and develop even after we invest in the business to develop those things. We look for companies that have a willingness to bring in outside critics. 
No one thinks that they've invented it perfectly, and there is no other way to do things. We like businesses who know what they know well, but are always open uh, to new ideas. Uh, we think that uh, bringing in successful managers and leaders from other organizations to cross-fertilize great ideas and people who are open to that is, is a good uh, recipe for creating succession and, and, uh, and success. Uh, we look for strong development of the people underneath. And in, uh, obviously in the Navy, evaluations are core to what's done. Believe it or not, in businesses, that's not always the case. And if it isn't the case, we uh, rigorously implement it and encourage our managers to start the peer reviews that include uh, verbal feedback, which a lot of people find to be probably the most difficult thing that they have to do with their subordinates. They might give them written feedback, but to sit down and talk these people through it in an encouraging way is something we try and implement and put in place. We talk about 360 evaluations, where we get feedback from the subordinates on where improvements can be made for the leaders that are over them as part of a way to help develop the organization. We look for team sharing, meaning you have a great person who's fantastic at their job. And probably the worst thing that you can do is take that person out of that role and transplant them to some other part of the organization. But the fact is, if you don't do that, if you don't have an organization that tries to cross-fertilize experiences and continually challenge the great people in an organization, they will leave. And you'll have a problem following them. So every business I'm involved in today is global. And so all the people we have have to have experiences in operating in cultures and in systems that are different than what they're used to. We will take and have taken the best people in our financial team and move them over to China, where we're opening up new markets. Very different culture, very different business environment there. You've got language issues, you've got cultural issues. It's an enormous challenge. And we take people and put them in that position, and they come back better leaders as a result of it. They bring over best practices, and they discover new best practices. So in the companies we're involved in, we're constantly talking about where are they going next? What do they need to be challenged in the new role they're having? We find that that breeds an environment and a culture of people growing, people being ready to take over the job of their senior leader. As I tell my senior CEOs and CFOs, the best thing you can do is develop a team that you're replaceable. And it's a little bit of an intimidating thing for them to hear from one of their lead investors and board members. We obviously don't do that, but the whole point is there may come a situation that they need that person in another part of the world to act CEO, and only by developing an environment where they could replace the current CEO will they be able to take on that challenge. And then the last thing I'll finish with that we try and look for, in my business it's all about taking risk. And the thing that I talk about a lot is you have to have a risk-taking culture, but you have to tolerate failure. And it's a funny thing, because in our business, too many failures and we're losing our, our investment. But if you don't have an environment that tolerates failure, you're not going to have an environment that tolerates the risk that is necessary to advance a business. And it's a balance on finding between those two the small failures for the big successes. And I put those challenges to my senior leadership to allow that and encourage that to happen. People seek that. They want to take risks. The very best do. And no one's perfect. Failures will happen. It happens across every business. So what happens when they do fail? How do they remedy it? How do they get better for it? Thanks. OK, would you just join me uh, in a brief round of applause for our panelists and their opening remarks? Thank you. OK, so what I'd like uh, for you to do is if you have questions, we would like to establish a dialogue now. So if you have questions, please migrate uh, to your left or right. Uh, you've been down this road before. So turn on the microphone. Please just let us who you are, you are briefly. And if you're directing your question to a specific panelist, please go ahead and do that. Uh, and we will start with this gentleman to my left. All right. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for your input. 
Uh, my name is Colin Billings, and I'm a student at the Jepson School of Leadership at the University of Richmond. Um, this question is uh, pretty much directed at Coach Brandt. Um, you talked a lot uh, in your introduction about the amount of time that you spend in your office and um, how you're stuck there a lot um, doing a lot of planning uh, for your position. And my question is kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first of which is how much of effective leadership is, is the result of planning and a structural execution of a mission or objective? And how much of leadership is a result of both an inherent and or learned ability to improvise and adjust a plan? And um, the second part of my question asks, uh, are these two different types of leadership or is it a process uh, which is sort of a spectrum uh, that you have to cross? It's a good question. You yeah. said there were two parts. I think that good might, luck with that, might be three. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, you know, and it's probably a question that we even take some time to think about. But I think to answer it quickly, I mean, it's a good question to ask, okay, well, what, what, what parts of this are, are planning and predetermined and all that? And, and clearly there's um, a, a, a strong need for leaders to be able to think on their feet and act and make decisions. And, you know, my initial reaction is that it's equal parts. Um, you know, you, you asked, the second part of your question, to help me again with that, can you, can you tell me what you just finished with? I'm sorry. Um, well, it was kind of just uh, the question of whether uh, it's two different uh, forms of leadership, like a planning and structural leadership versus uh, kind of an active improvisational leadership. Yeah, my, my, my opinion would be no. You know, I read somewhere, um, and, and this may not be directly related, but, you know, <clears throat> Vince Lombardi said something to the effect that he said, you know, leadership is, is not just one quality, it's a blend of many qualities. And then I think he made, and, and you know, this relates maybe indirectly, but I think he made an important statement that's always impacted me. You know, he said, said you don't become um, more fair uh, by being uh, less firm, for example. You, you know what I mean? I mean, there's, there's, this, there's this kind of two ends of a spectrum thing, and I, I, I'm a big proponent, and I'll throw this in and then I'll stop talking, not answer, be a, have a long answer to the question, but one of the principles in my leadership philosophy is literally called, and this is kind of a Jim Collins thing, uh, the genius of the and. So genius of the and is putting two things together that you know, are at first at least thought not to go together. Uh, for example, you know, discipline and creativity. Well, clearly everybody just assumes those are two things on the opposite end of the spectrum. How could you ever have both? And so, you know, most people are caught in what might be called the tyranny of the or. Well, you can have one or the other. Um, I do think there is a genius. There is, there is something critical and key and unique when you can put those two things together. So, you know, only with respect to the, you know, your question that you were, you were kind of getting after, well, there's these two ends of the spectrum. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's both, uh, even as opposed to a balance. I mean, it's spinning two plates high up in the air and having them go fast as opposed to lowering one so you can put up the other. Uh, at a different time, if that makes sense. Thanks, Coach. Excellent. Very thoughtful question. All right. Uh, this young lady to my right. Come on. Oh, there we go. Third class Martin, United States Naval Academy. My question is intended for the alumni on our panel today. Since you all have been at the academy, there's been a number of changes in the way we choose to develop leaders here. I'm sure all you guys had the last plebe summer and all that, but um, I was wondering what changes you've seen to our leadership program that you see either as productive or counterproductive to leaders and whether you approve or disapprove of different things you've seen. Well, we, we have three alums, including myself, and they're to my right. Uh, perhaps, maybe, Admiral, you can start sure. first in what you've observed in terms of how Naval Academy approaches leader development contrasted or compared with when you were here, and then perhaps Mr. Sullivan can uh, comment also. Okay, the, uh, you know, the, the structure uh, right now is, uh, has some formality to it. That is classrooms and books and things that you read. Uh, but in my day, you know, it was uh, an education kind of by osmosis, you know, that is, you know, we. We were associated with good leaders, good superintendents here, and, and we aspired to become uh, like them. Um, but quite frankly, 55 years ago, and I guess the happy note here is that, that uh, things are much better than they were 55 years ago. Uh, leadership was kind of an afterthought to the curriculum, and the, the company officers would kind of 
assemble the first class and go down in the basement and and uh, I, I think, as I recall, there was a, a film we'd see, but it wasn't very structured. But but it's amazing what sticks with you over the years. And I remember this one film. I mentioned this to a, a, a panel group the other day that they showed a uh, an officer, uh, and they showed him in profile view, so that they were seeing the right side of his face, and he was smiling. And uh, and then shortly thereafter, he turned this way, and he'd be frowning. And what they were pointing out was your point, Keith, about consistency. That a good leader has to be consistent. But, but certainly, uh, I think things have improved certainly uh, since uh, since I was midshipman. Jim. Yeah, I would concur. I, I would tell you that uh, it probably, and and I'm 30-something years dated, but uh, back then, um, it was more informal. We used to pejoratively call it leader sleep. Uh, in that day, I don't know whether it still holds that moniker today. I would tell you that, uh, and, and it was a lot of trial and error, and there was a few classes you took. Uh, the whole uh, area of leadership has become uh, much more formalized. There's a curriculum scientifically based uh, and the like. I'm, I'm seeing it uh, both here at the academy um, I guest lecture at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Business, and I spend time out at Stanford, which is where I went to business school, and they have a, a center of leadership out there as well. So you see all the leading schools in the country that have uh, faculty that are spending many hours in a day scientifically studying this, coming up with new ways of doing things, cross-fertilizing best ideas, and I think for the young developing leaders, it's an enormous advantage because a lot of what we did, unfortunately, was trial and error back in the day. And as always with those things, on the error side, you had uh, casualties, if you will. So it's better today. It can always improve. But I'd say it's, it's a more formalized learning process. And, and I believe way back there was even a view that you couldn't teach leadership. It was almost an a, a inborn trait. And I think people have moved away from that and now believe that uh, leadership can be taught to all. Everyone in this room can be and become a good leader. And that's what this is all about. And I think that's a good thing, not only in the military, but for those who move on to the other venues of life, not-for-profit, for-profit, whatever it may be. It's an important element. And the grounding you're going to get here uh, will, I guarantee you, it will serve you well in w whatever you path you go on in life. And, and if I could just add to sort of draw it back to the context of the, of, of the panel, um, Mr. Sullivan made a, a point earlier about um, no one is irreplaceable. So I think besides this sort of continuum of leader development, it's essential to perpetuate a cycle of success uh, embracing the notion that you as a leader are responsible for training your replacement. And I've, that's always been sort of my mantra is, is that I may not be here, particularly in my line of work, tomorrow will the organization survive if I'm no longer here? The answer has to be yes. And it's your responsibility as a leader to ensure that the answer is yes. De facto, training your replacements, making sure they're ready. Over here, please. Rachel Stumeller, United States Military Academy. My question is for Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, you mentioned honor and integrity um, while you were speaking. How have you applied the honor and integrity that you learned at the Naval Academy to the business world? Can you give a concrete example of a decision that you've made that you think differs from the decision that the majority of your peers would make based on your ethics? And how has that contributed to your success? Well, what, what I would say is the example that, that I can think of is uh, we, uh, my firm and the board had a senior level manager that did an unethical thing and there was some debate within our organization, not our organization, but at the board level as to what the remedy would be. It was a fairly important person uh, and, and uh, the impact to the organization would be fairly dramatic. I would tell you that, though, um, I don't know if it would differentiate me from the others. The board that we had developed in this company, uh, the conversation, uh, while we had one, was not a very long one because, in our view, 
there were certain codes that we had set out that we wanted as an organization that we wanted to be represented as a, as a firm, as a company. And the board that had joined, we recruit outside directors to the companies I'm involved with. Everyone that we recruited shared that vision. So it was a fairly short conversation that we had uh, and we made the decision and we moved on. Uh, I'd like to think that in, in my business, every person would have come out the same door. It wasn't black and white, it was a gray type situation that I'm referring to. Um, but it's those kinds of decisions, I think, that do test you. Because at the end of the day, I'm in the money making business. Schools like the Naval Academy, if they are to give us funds, they want us to return those funds at a multiple of money, 3x. So the only dilemma is, this is not going to help that shareholder value creation. But I have to do, and we have to do as an organization, the right thing. Because back to that culture thing, the messaging of that, when it got through the organization, and make no mistake, it gets to the organization right down to the lowest level employee, it would happen. And, and it, again, it was a fairly short conversation. I'd be lying if I didn't say to you, we didn't think about, okay, what are the ramifications? We, we have to move this person out. Are there ways we can do it that would make it better for the company financially? And the short answer on that is no. You got to eliminate the person. You got to eliminate the person now. We have to move on. And we did it. And we do the same thing again in the same circumstance. Great question. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Alex Mace. I am from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Um, Coach Brandt, you mentioned uh, the idea of following the melody in your head. Uh, and Rear Admiral Schumacher, you mentioned kind of the idea of ambition in your first point. Um, my question deals with whether, whether from personal experience, preferably I'd, I'd like you to answer the question, um, in the public sector or in the military, how do you balance your personal ambitions with uh, the vision of and your responsibility to um, kind of the authority above you, the kind of organizational hierarchy, um, and whoever wants to tackle it. Yeah, we haven't had, uh, it's a hard question, and we haven't had uh, Commander Hoskins respond yet. Did, uh, did you get a full appreciation for the question he's asking? It's sort of this balance between, you know, your desire to be successful as an individual, and I'm paraphrasing, versus yeah. uh, balancing that and harmonizing that with the, the success of the larger organization. Um, I mean, you were, you know, as a former Blue Angel, I mean, uh, you know, it obviously was good to be you, and, uh, you know, how do you balance that with the, you know, with the larger purpose? Yeah, okay. That's a, uh, that's a great question. And I, I could go down several uh, different paths uh, with a comparison of my, um, you know, my personal performance as compared to an institution. And, and now that you mentioned the, the Blue Angel experience, I guess I could touch on that first. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, walking into an organization like the United States Naval Flight Demonstration Squadron, uh, you walk in the door and you realize that you're surrounded by, obviously, a bunch of type A personalities. I mean, folks that uh, uh, pour their heart into their job, that uh, love their service, uh, the Navy or the Marine Corps, respectively. We had both. And uh, also embracing what the Blue Angels uh, stands for the legacy of the team, you know, understanding that back in 1946, somebody had an idea that I think we need to get the word out that there's actually airplanes in the Navy uh, after World War II. And the type of folks that they brought into that organization to make it what it was then, again, that legacy must carry on. It's, it's the big picture of the people that have gone before us and what we represent. And also for the current environment of what the Blue Angels represent and how we are trying to recruit the best and the brightest uh, to join the Naval and Marine Corps service. Uh, my personal uh, performance as compared to the others uh, that were on the team, I, I, I think we're on par. And uh, there is a, a phrase that I've used, you know, in some of my commands that I've been in, you know, it's the uh, institutional, institutionalized perpetuation of mediocrity. You know, that doesn't happen in the Blue Angels. It doesn't happen in other commands that I've been involved with because you, you, can't, you can't have that margin of excellence if that's how you think. Um, so I, I embrace the ideals of excellence in every organization that I've been in. And I will personally 
you know, I, I talked about the thing where you, um, well, the principle where you have to evaluate yourself and you have to evaluate that institution. It's the same thing. Every institution that you go to, you must evaluate that institution, the foundations of principles that it's built upon. You have to do a self-evaluation and you have to raise to the level of that institution. Yeah, this is a, an interesting, uh, interesting topic because, you know, as we think about perpetuating a cycle of success within any organization, clearly individuals have to feel like, like they're recognized, like they're valuable, like they're important, um, not at the risk of uh, that over, you know, the larger, writ larger uh, organization. M uh, the only thing I would like to add is, you know, it's okay to do both. It's okay to recognize the individual and make the individual feel important. It's also important to make them realize that they're part of a larger group with a greater purpose. My only comment would be is that if you recognize individuals, the recognition has to be genuine and authentic because people always know when they're being patronized. And uh, there's always this temptation to over deliver the individual accolade goods at the expense of it meaning something. All right, over here. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Coggin, coming from the Jepson Leadership School, Richmond, Virginia. Um, this is for Mr. Sullivan. It's an ec economic question, but I'm sure it has political and um, strategic ramifications. The question is, the events in Tunisia and Egypt and the rest of the Middle East has shattered any lasting illusion that of any um, stable global market. My question for you is, one, how do you mitigate those inevitable risks of investments in these places? And two, and I think even more importantly, how do you capitalize on the secondary and tertiary effects that, that these ripples will have on the global economic climate? Thank you, sir. Yeah, you know, I think it's relevant. You know, this discussion of risk and, uh, you know, how do we perpetuate success uh, knowing full well that a little too much risk, uh, he's obviously looking at it through this global lens, but obviously, you know, right. how much risk is, uh, is foolish, perhaps? Well, we've, we've actually invested uh, in companies um, that, that have gone to uh, what we would call, and this isn't the area you just mentioned, which is the Mideast, um, but, but other developing areas of the world that, that um, are volatile with respect to uh, the politics and uh, as importantly um, with related to that is currency which is something uh, 10 years ago I didn't even think about all my investments were principally made uh, domestically and in dollars and we give a lot of thought these days because our businesses are so global as to what the impact might be in the currencies in those markets and then how do you get the the, the cash out, what's the currency conversion coming over? So it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. I think as everyone here knows, the fastest growing markets in the world are the emerging markets. And we have to go there, we have to have businesses that are going there uh, if we want businesses that are growing uh, quickly. The most difficult thing to assess is, is uh, the stability, the political stability of a government. Um, we've used history as a marker to a degree, so there have been regions of the world that, quite honestly, we have avoided for that reason. Uh, we made a recent investment in the telecommunication area that went to uh, parts of the world that were more volatile, and um, it hasn't worked out well. Um, so I would say to you that uh, we're, we're probably back to our roots in making a better assessment of that. It is a difficult thing to assess, and the politics are principally the most difficult thing to assess because all kinds of things can occur. They can literally seize your business. Um, the government can seize your business, which happened in one of our businesses that we invest in, the subsidiary in that market. The government basically told us, we have that now, it's ours, thank you. They assessed a huge tax effectively on the business and, um, in an overnight fashion. So. It's hard to do. Uh, we have to be risk takers, as I said. You have to tolerate small failures. That was a little bigger than a small failure. Um, but that's the business we're in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Emma from the University of Pennsylvania. 
Um, I'm wondering, we've heard from a lot of really successful speakers um, these past two days who are high ranking, very successful, but in the civilian world, we don't have ranks. Um, and a lot of us graduate without having any chance to jump into leadership or have any kind of subordinates. So how do we get past that period where it seems like there's just no opportunity to, to have any type of leadership role? You know, we're just making copies, making coffee, sending faxes. Um, do you just sit back and wait for an opportunity or what kind of proactive steps can you actually take um, when you're sort of at the bottom of the totem pole? Uh, and I know you didn't direct it to someone. I, I'd like to give perhaps two panelists different perspectives. Um, Admiral Shoemaker spent eight years incarcerated and certainly his rank may not have meant a whole lot to the North Vietnamese. I'm wondering how did you look for leadership opportunities given your circumstances in Vietnam and then and then maybe ask Coach Brandt to talk a little bit about that, that same question because he does not have a military background and I know he spent a long time as an assistant coach before he had his opportunity. So maybe these two panelists could take a, take a shot at your question. Admiral? Okay, I'll start off. You know, everybody starts off at the bottom and, uh, um, you know, you know it's, it's just a matter of self-improvement and, and seeking opportunities. Uh, you know, I'd encourage you to uh, go beyond uh, just the bachelor level uh, because what, what the world seeks is, is, is a person of knowledge. And if you're able to develop some expertise in some specific field, you're going to be known as the go-to gal. And when, when a subject comes up or a question comes up, they're going to go to you as, as the expert. And th that's going to cause you to be recognized, you to be elevated. But but you know, uh, success isn't always how many people you, you control or, or how much gold you wear on your shoulders or whatnot. Really, su success is in your own heart. And if you know that you did a good job, even if, if it's only copying something, uh, th then I, I, yeah, you ought to feel good about what you did yourself, you know. And, and in, in a lot of respects, that ought to be reward enough. But uh, uh, networking is, uh, is, is worthwhile. Make sure you, you develop uh, friends that uh, uh, bring opportunities to you. And, and I think you're going to succeed. Coach? You know, I. I, I said something in, in my opening remarks about leadership being attitude and action or something like that rather than title or position. And so, you know, your, your question could go a couple different ways. But, I mean, I, I, I press everybody on, you know, in terms of people that I work with, even if it's someone not on my team, but even freshmen on our team, um, we really try to live that out. And so I, I just believe in a leadership attitude. And so those people then become developing leaders as opposed to somebody who's just, you know, waiting for a break or whatever it happens to be. Also came to mind, um, you know, I heard, I heard a definition of excellence a number of years ago that I love. And excellence is one of those buzzwords that we all, you know, kind of talk about and everybody's well convinced, every organization that they have it and that sort of thing. I think sometimes we're hard pressed to define it. But, you know, if you, if you listen to this, I heard excellence described as deliberate actions, ordinary in themselves, performed consistently and carefully, added together, compounded over time equals excellence. I love that definition because, you know, again, it speaks to any of us in our given roles, what we actually do, as opposed to, you know, right, uh, what our bio reads or, or whatever, which is the result, hopefully, of these good things. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's interesting because I can only view uh, this experience through, through a military lens, but I, I will comment that you know, just because you have a certain formal rank within, let's say, a military structure, um, people will certainly obey you because of your formal authority. But people are not obliged to respect you. And regardless of where you are, that's really what you're trying to get. You want to ensure that you associate yourself with an organization you know, that has a development, a human capital development plan. Military does this pretty well. Um, it's formalized and codified. But uh, as you search for your opportunities, you want to ensure that the organization you align yourself with is focused and committed to human capital development, a formal development plan, uh, so that you can uh, hit your wagon to that. All right, over this side, please. 
Jing Hao Lu from Penn State University. Um, I have a question regarding to the globalization of leadership. Um, we have already talked about more and more business wants to go globe, and there's an emerging number of uh, civil actors in the global stage, such as Amnesty International. My question is, um, there are more opportunities for a leader to uh, lead a group with great diversity. What are the possible uh, ways to mitigate the communication barriers as a result of the nationality, culture, and uh, other kind of practices? Um, what, what do panelists think about this? Thank you. Yeah, this is a great question. You know, the United States military is probably the most heterogeneous large organization, at least in the United States. Um, so I'd like maybe Commander Hoskins to talk about his experience dealing with diversity as an operational commanding officer, and then let any of the other panelists who may, uh, may want to comment on this. But yeah, I, th I think you're right. You know, diversity can certainly be an asset that can be leveraged in an organization, but it can also at times paralyze an organization a bit. So maybe, Judge, your comments, sir? Sure, and, and just as a, you know, a battalion officer here at the United States Naval Academy, uh, this is an uh, unpaid commercial, but uh, you know, we obviously have language and cultural studies uh, here at the United States Naval Academy, and I think for the most, most of the midshipmen that, that come here, there's an understanding of the type of global environment that we work in currently, and the need for our future leaders to have the ability to not only speak the language, but understand the culture. And I, I think if you have an, you know, an educational institution that has that type of program, then you know, that, obviously that just enhances the globalization uh, across the board in America. But the United States Naval Academy, I think, has, does a great uh, job with that. Now, as far as the, uh, you know, the di diversification of, of, of people in an organization, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a buzzword today. Uh, people talk about it, people talk about the advantages, people talk about the disadvantages of diversity within an organization. And I can tell you that if you have an organization that outwardly reaches out to other entities, rather it's here in the United States or abroad, to have the ability to have a set of people that are from different backgrounds, ethnicity, uh, hardships, religion, uh, and so forth. I mean, male, female, you name it. I mean, you, there's a long list. I, I think as a leader, how awesome is it to walk into a room with that type of composition of a team where they can guide you, educate you, steer you, uh, when you have to make some real tough decisions or when you have to put yourself in a certain environment. Uh, so diversification is, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think we need to continue, I mean, as a nation, as an educational institution, to broaden, uh, you know, the, the spectrum on bringing in all the different cultures and, and continuing to outreach. Thanks. And may, maybe, Mr. Sullivan, do you just want to perhaps maybe add your, your perspective since I think the question was maybe sure focus more towards the economic side of, of yeah. leadership it's 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 becoming as I said a, a very important today and quite honestly my experience it's one of the worst things I could say about Americans is we, we as, a, as a culture at least in my generation most of us are monolingual and my colleagues in in Europe and in Asia are bilingual if not more in Europe it is literally a badge of honor if they speak four and five languages so um, it's a bit humbling. I will say this. Uh, we just took an American manager of one of my big companies, uh, to, again, cross-fertilizing what I spoke earlier, and brought him over to Germany. And he started taking one of those language classes. He's 40-something years old. I thought I had read somewhere that at that age, the brain is hardwired, ain't going to work. But he was out there working it at night, trying to do his day job. And the German senior management came to him and said, if you learn a few phrases, so you make the effort, the fact you're moving your whole family over to Germany, we will surround you with people who are bilingual, and everybody is, or more. Um, they appreciate that. They appreciate the fact you're living in their town, right by the plant. You're out there walking the floor. You're in the cafeteria eating with them. They'll reach out to you because you're making 
a pretty good effort to, to reach them and learn more of their business on their territory. So I think it's as much the effort. I will say, uh, and I advise my children, I can't tell you that they listen to what I say, take the languages, like what I hear they're learning, and, and they have majors here at the academy that I was speaking with the midshipmen at lunch. Get learned in the languages. You will need it. You'll probably won't listen to me either, but at least I can say I told you, because it will be important down the road. Thank you. Sure, go ahead, sir. Uh, you know, I say uh, how you solve the diversity problem is you rally around the flag. You know, you, you emphasize the things, the common traits that uh, people from diverse backgrounds have. And certainly, uh, the greatest trait we have here in, uh, is that we're Americans. And we, we ought to emphasize that. But uh, the commander's comments, I think, are right on. And that is that, that uh, if everybody looked alike and thought alike, uh, you know, it would be kind of a dull world. And uh, when you're when you have quite a number of people from different backgrounds, uh, I think you're enriched by their experiences. And I'm proud of my uh, association with the U.S. Navy because um, it, it doesn't seem to be important to a Navy guy uh, whether uh, uh, your parents were uh, wealthy or, or whether you came from whatever background. It's a common denominator. And a lot of times we've griped in the Navy about um, being having social experiments forced on us, and uh, you know people objected to having uh, 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 women in the in the navy for a while, and you know I, I read something on the uh, internet the other day. We've got the first uh, female CAG uh, uh, air wing commander. So uh, I, I think we're enriched overall by the diversity that we've all experienced. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, Amin Habibnia, University of Texas. Uh, this is for Commander Hoskins. Uh, would you offer to share a personal specific account when you had to uh, specifically address an individual who did allow an opportunity to lead pass by and was only interested specifically on uh, his or her own individual, I guess, uh, moving on up? Okay. All right. Great question. Um, again, I, I just want to preference since. Um, you know, again, in the military, we have different rank structures. And of course, that happened to me as a very young junior officer. I was a lieutenant. Um, as a lieutenant commander, which is the next rank above lieutenant, that's when we actually have the opportunity to uh, be in charge of a department. And there's four departments within an aviation squadron. Uh, and then as an 05, the rank I am now, a commander, that's when we uh, command. Um, I've, I've had many instances uh, of that because folks are, are, are just so hesitant. And, and if I could touch on the previous question, you know, hey, you know, how, do you, how do you get the attention of folks that you can be a leader if you're making copies and you're doing these things? You, know, um, you always have to have that optimism, okay? You always have to be an optimist and, and be very uh, you know, proud of the position that you are in and also uh, working towards greater leadership and greater responsibility. And how do you imbue that in folks? Well, obviously you have to set the example if you are the leader. Say, hey, you know what? You work hard, you can get here, you can do this. Um, and I've, I've had several instances where you have that young junior officer when you're a lieutenant commander or a commander that you know, we, we have this area, the ready room, where all the pilots hang out before we go into our briefs. And I have come in as a commanding officer, pointed to a lieutenant, uh, uh, that was in a squadron, probably been in a squadron for two months. And I said, hey, listen, I've got something going on. I need you to put the, you know, the briefing board where we brief the flight. And I need you to brief it and I need you to lead it. Uh, and then I walk out of the room. I walk out of the room. I said, you got it. Because I'm busy doing something. I need you to step up. And the key to that is, and I, and I think, again, when I, when I talk about that empowerment piece that I, I spoke of earlier, I think that the people that have worked for me understand that I am empowering you. I am telling you that you can lead. I'm fine with it. And you know what? You're not going to go out and you're, you're not going to be perfect at it at first. And that is okay. Because that's where you learn how to be a leader. You have to make small mistakes. And uh, you have to have someone there along your, you know, your side to help you uh, as you develop into a leader. And I can tell you that more than not, those individuals that were very hesitant to step up once I gave them the lead and uh, after the flight was done, 
or after the debrief was done where we pointed out all the goods and all the others from the flight, they can realize that, you know what, I actually do have the potential to be a great leader. And the next day they get better and better. Uh, but you, you have to develop that. You have to, you know, step up, take the lead. It's okay to make small failures. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we're talking about perpetuating a cycle of success, clearly challenging the young to step up and gain this confidence is important. I'm just curious, Coach, what do you look for in the young men on your team as sort of markers that they're ready for what Commander Hoskins suggests, which is a, okay, buddy, you step up to the plate. This is, uh, this is your chance. Yeah, I mean, I'd give you a quick, very specific example, and it's related to uh, what I've been talking about with creating a culture. You know, all these decisions you make as a leader, they end up creating a culture. It could be a positive one, it could be a negative one, it could be uh, somewhere in the middle or, or whatever. But I've always believed, for example, in a team environment, um, you know, I've had a lot of coaches come up to me over the years and say, you know, kind of something to the effect that, yeah, well, if, if we were as deep as your team, you know, we'd be good too, this sort of comment. And, you know, you got to be careful what you say in response to that. But in my mind, you know, one of our principles is um, I've always believed in enabling your depth. And I'll give you a very concrete example of how you do that. You know, I, most Division One soccer teams will carry 24, 25 guys and uh, religiously and consistently play only 14. And you look at box scores, period. I, I'm not quite sure what the others are on the team for. And if you look hard, it's, it's, it's a revolving door. Those are the bottom 10 guys go in and out every year. And I've always believed in playing deep, and I've done things like, I mean, I will do often things like in the 10th game of the season uh, against a good opponent. Because if you do it against somebody that you know you're going to beat by four, I think it's cheap, and, and everybody knows that. You know, I just start somebody that uh, has played maybe 90 minutes total in the first nine games. That's 10 minutes a game. That's not very much. I mean, that's just a little bit of a bit part. But, you know, that enables the depth because what happens is, and I may only play that person for 30, 35 minutes. They may not get back in the game. But the fact that they started and went in under the fire uh, means that the next time they go in, closer to the end of the game, they'll take themselves more seriously. They will be just on fire, motivated. Just these little decisions that either enable or disable uh, the people that you work with. I don't know if that helps. Thanks, Coach. All right, I think we'll probably have maybe a chance for two more, but if you want to stay in place, we'll see this gentleman over here. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Kalen Urquhart from the University of Pacific in California. This question is for Mr. Sullivan and Coach Brandt primarily, because I see your occupations is very similar. Um, you bring expertise to a group of people, yet the group has to implement it, and you have such a stake in it and how they implement, but you're not on the field, you're not in the management team um, always. And, and really the Bono quote resonates me um, as a musician and as working with social enterprises that are mission driven. Um, my question surrounds when an organization is struggling to find that melody, um, to be successful in playing it, what do you do, um, maybe the timing, but what leadership qualities do you use and how do you approach the organization, the team, to help them find maybe a new melody or um, to refine that melody? That's, pretty, that's a pretty tough question. Isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, I, I left a very successful organization, uh, a place where, where uh, you know, I would have been comfortable and had it made and had learned how to dominate the market, so to speak, for a place that was kind of bottom of the barrel and an organization that was really struggling and there was no melody. And so for me, it, it, w it was simply um, coming here and um, defining what it was, that, you know, what that melody was that we would hear in our head. And so, you know, s simply telling that story, I, I, you know, I talk to that, to my team about that quote um, regularly. I mean, you know, um, and, and planting that seed in their minds that there is something more uh, that we're after, a higher purpose. And so, you know, we've taken this, I don't know if this helps or not, but we, I mean, we've taken this, this issue for us, it is our desire. I mean, you stop any of our players and, and you're like, what's the purpose of your team? And we're like, we exist to be extraordinary. We exist to be the model in Division I athletics of what an extraordinary team is. They'll just say it. You know, it's because I put a tape recorder under their pillow at night and it's just, boom, boom, you know, uh, it may as well be. And so, you know, that, that's maybe part of your question. Maybe Mr. Sullivan can help uh, with the rest. But, um, you know, I, I think for me, Division One athletics and, and much of leadership, athletics, business world or whatever, there is no melody. 
trying to win, trying to make money, period. There's nothing else. And so for me, the fact that there's a story, that there's a higher purpose to go after is critical. And then I trust that doing it in that way, I mean, we're taking dead aim at winning, but what we're going to do it that way. And we're idealistic and stubborn about it, and we're trusting them that that will produce good results. So if, uh, if there's a management team who you're considering investing in and either you don't hear the melody, it either doesn't exist or it's not the right one, uh, how do you inspire that? I think that's what you're most interested in is if it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was going to interpret it a little differently. If, Please, go if, ahead. If we, if we see an investment where they're not singing the right melody, uh, as I said earlier, we're, we're more to use a Warren Buffett phrase, jockey betters rather than horse betters, meaning we, we bet on the management team. So there have been situations I've come in, interesting business, interesting industry, not the management team, not the right culture. We walk. We don't invest. I thought what you were saying is, okay, what happens if I misjudged? We misjudge. That's then what do we do? Well, hopefully we're not completely wrong. And then what we do is spend a lot of time, if we have the right leadership development processes in place, and looking at within the senior team, again, it always starts at the top, and within that senior team, is there a person that needs to be replaced? Is there a person, is there somebody within the organization that we can promote into a, a position where they can start to create that melody that you speak to, to drive the, 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 the team forward? It doesn't always have to be the CEO but it's typically within the top three or four people within that organization. A lot of times the CEO, for example, is, doesn't have the right development going underneath them, and so they're busy doing the nuts and bolts and not thinking strategically. If you get the right second in command, the right XO, as we'd say, that makes the CEO a lot better. And I can think of a few instances where we, we brought in a better XO and it made our CEO much better and the company overall much better. Thank you. Okay, well, I lied. We only had time for one more. I, ap I apologize. I know you're standing there patiently. I, I do know that the panelists, maybe some of them, would be willing to wait up here or entertain perhaps some uh, questions after the fact. Uh, I apologize. I led you on, but I want to I finish on time. Uh, on behalf of all the attendees, uh, the four panelists, uh, I thought it was a rich conversation. I appreciate you spending your time and sharing your thoughts with everyone. Um, I'd like for, again, for you to join me in expressing your appreciation to the panelists, please.